Well, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Chairman, it's a great, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here, and uh, thank you for the invitation to uh, play this role. Uh, let me tell you at the outset that uh, I am not going to uh, read to you a prepared uh, text, so this is not something that was uh, taken from the deep freeze to be put in the microwave today. It's freshly baked, uh, but it may not be uh, especially perfect. Um, had the timing of this been a week or two ago, we would have been on the eve of uh, Bloomsday, and I think perhaps if I was describing what you're about to listen to, it's a bit of a stream of consciousness, but not with the elegance of uh, Joycean uh, phraseology. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do is to thank the Institute of International European Affairs and the European Commission uh, for undertaking this initiative, and both to those present and those uh, who have left uh, a great word of gratitude to the participants who contributed as speakers and to all those, including all of those of you still here, who've been participants uh, at this uh, conference. The timing, of course, was deliberate, uh, although picked long in advance, uh, lucky that it actually happened to coincide uh, precisely with uh, the European summit, and especially lucky that it happened to coincide uh, with two significant Italian victories in the last 24 hours. Uh, the one of them, the sports one, has been remarked by one or two speakers, but I think the other, it's by no means an exclusive uh, victory for Italian diplomacy, but I have little doubt that the European experience of Mario Monte was a critical part of the chemistry of consent uh, by, of course, putting some uh, sand in the cogs of the wheels uh, late enough yesterday evening to cause people to sit up and take some notice of some of the issues that, in other terms, risked to be deferred for another occasion. It has been said here today by Patrick Honahan that we now have a sense from yesterday of direction with political backing. And I think uh, the new initiatives, uh, especially in the uh, so-called banking union area, uh, are particularly important because I agree very much with the very summary, high uh, summary uh, phrase of uh, President Herman Van Rompuy to the media in the small hours of the morning uh, that it's designed to try to attempt to break the vicious circle between sovereigns and banking, and I think that is good. I think the union itself has shown a considerable capacity to learn by doing. Um, certainly, and it started uh, today already with the remarks of uh, Barbara Nolan, again, several speakers talked about the pace of democratic decision-making in a complex union with multi-level governance and a multiplicity of uh, interests and not always interests which run in the same direction and the instantaneous quality of market reaction. And these are two very different time cycles. My own sense uh, for what it's worth, and I've, I've said this before, I think we need to bring the decision-making system, uh, what Brendan Halligan today referred to as the toolkit. I think he said Mr. Van Rompuy admitted when he arrived in his job, he looked in the kit and there were no tools. And it's a pretty good description for a deal of what has been uh, learned. But I, I, I think um, in, in, in this regard that the, the development of a, a, a toolkit which has three characteristics is important. I would call it a, a political AAA rating. The first day is about assessment in depth with conditionality as a consequence. And clearly we have moved in that direction and we may deepen that. The second day is about the availability of a sufficient volume of funds, whether through the ESM and or funding capacity of the European Central Bank uh, or the residual funds of the uh, financial uh, stability uh, facility. Uh, so the second day about availability and the third day is to find in Europe the toolkit that permits a degree of automaticity. That if you're in this space, there is an agent, there is an agency, there is a capacity to respond. Because every time that we have a, a response that lacks that quasi or actual automaticity, we will have exactly the time cycle clash between the quality of markets 
and the quality of European decision making. And I think the sooner we can get our decision making process into this political AAA zone of assessment with conditionality and in depth, of availability of sufficient funds and of a degree of automaticity of response, we risk to have the AAA to do with uh, states and their credit rating or banks and their credit rating uh, stay in a period of extended uh, stress. Uh, I'm reminded uh, of a speech uh, today that A.J. Chopra gave to Trinity uh, College students during one of his visits here to Dublin where he chose to introduce his uh, speech by quoting the, uh, the uh, Roman uh, dramatist uh, and philosopher uh, of, uh, in and around uh, the time of Christ and after, uh, Seneca. And I give you the quote, when a man does not know to which port he steers, no wind will be favorable. And I think there's a lot of wisdom in that quote. And a large part of Europe's search to a response to this crisis has been indeed to try to distill down what is the question, what are the questions. And I take my cue from that Seneca question, uh, what is the port, to say that I think today has been very good on this. I think a lot of our speakers from many different angles and perspectives and places uh, coalesce around this question of trying to understand the question and what is the question. I was struck today by the nature of John Bruton's opening uh, analysis. The origins of a crisis, he said, being deeper than finance. And I think it set a tone for the day the finance part is important, but it's not the whole part, and I think there's much uh, weight in what he said. Uh, the emphasis, he said, on adjustment that is respectful of underlying social solidarity is to do with striking a balance, an important dimension, a question that's indispensable to the evolution of the policy making. He challenged the narrowness of the wise men analysis, the references by Herman Van Rompuy, to a greater role, uh, modestly quoted in terms of the number of sentences, of European Parliament and national parliaments, and he said we need more. We need the energy of direct democracy that some one of these presidents has to go and search for a mandate and uh, search through that mandate for the shaping of the uh, big issues of governance, and in a way that respects, because you need a plurality of votes across the union, that respects the diversity of the circumstances and the needs of uh, different states. I dare say for what it's worth, but this is not the time in a closing speech to uh, develop it at length, uh, I actually think this question uh, needs another dimension as well. Uh, I have a deep conviction that uh, in its own terms, the process of European integration has been a powerful gift to several generations of Europeans and I believe that Ireland's engagement in it has been a powerful gift to the nation and to the people of Ireland. But I have been disturbed in the course of this crisis for some reasons which I can appreciate, but for other reasons about which I remain anxious, that larger states uh, have, of course, a large say, but that they've exercised this in a way that has appeared to exclude others and to be fully open to the voice of smaller states. And I do think if there's a new politics emerging to do with the sharing of sovereignty in more spaces, that as well as direct democracy, part of this equation has got to look at the recalibration of the balances that validate the rights of all without confusing the scale of all as being equal in scale. Uh, for my own part, uh, I've, uh, I've often used the formula about our own small state that we are not in the construction of Europe a tail on the European dog. We are through our own democracy, constitutional rights and shared sovereignty uh, a perfectly formed if small dog in our own right. And it's nice that we should be friendly and wag our tail a lot but we should also reserve the right occasionally to bark and to bite on our own account. And it seems to me that this capacity has been somewhat absent, not just to do with ourselves, but to do with the willingness of others to listen. And I think if we're having a discussion that touches on politics, this should be a part of it. Um, 
I'm reminded uh, too very much of a phrase that comes from Italy, from the Conti Cavour, after Garibaldi's unification 150, well, this year, 151 years ago, uh, he said, Italia è fatta e adesso dobbiamo fare gli italiani. We have made Italy, and now we must make or find her Italians. Well, I think, in a way, one of these issues now comes up again. We have made Europe. We are now remaking it. Crisis is reshaping it. Uh, globalization is reshaping it, but we cannot do it without our Europeans. I think Europe as a project of the elites or a new compact to do with political, fiscal, banking union and so on that is wholly, exclusively and only driven by the structuralism of circumstance is a deficient Europe if it doesn't have somewhere the heartbeat of engagement and active citizenship and I would agree with those commentators today who spoke uh, about that. John Bruton and Alan Lamassoure, in their own way, both touched on the need to avoid being imprisoned by what is just good for oneself, that there is that wider sense of mission. Alan Lamassoure reminded me of the Three Musketeers when he asked us to operate all for one and one for all. Uh, but he, he was, again, touching on that essential Europeanness of finding the way, the via media, to work through this. Uh, his sense, and I think John Bruton's sense earlier today, once, once the omelette is made, to quote uh, Alain, you cannot retrieve the eggs, as he said. Um, and indeed, we've had a very interesting economic debate there, whether or not to do with interests, capacity, and the evolution of this crisis over time, whether the omelette could be unmade or not, or apart from whether it should be unmade, and where the different interests might lie. If I park the, those political questions, I think a very interesting second set of questions came in the economic and financial domain. What should we expect from a banking union for Europe and for Ireland? Uh, Carl Whelan today uh, gave, I think, a very erudite exposition of the diversity of Irish bank debt, of the difference between the debt for dead banks and for others that hope to have a future. Um, he raised the question if we get European funding as a result of what happened yesterday and with its evolution in uh, policy substance over the coming months, what would be fair value if the uh, European stability mechanism was giving money, investing money in the Irish case? Uh, how would you deal um, uh, with all of this in getting the money and deal with the implicit sense that it's a second bailout? And how, you, how do we in Ireland prepare the way to get back on markets, but to get our share of what's available? And we need to develop this discourse, not to be frightened of it. We may not want to call it a bailout. Let's find what the language is, and let's uh, work our way uh, through that. I thought his uh, analysis about the complexity of retro retrofitting Irish debt to do with any new European model was particularly interesting. Uh, Governor Patrick Honaghan then, uh, in quoting the IEA uh, study of 20 years ago, and indeed uh, his own part, but which in all modesty he didn't himself recite, but Brendan Halligan reminded us of that, reminded me a little bit of a sign that I saw uh, many years ago on a visit to Bray. Uh, for those visiting Ireland, uh, Bray is a seaside town in County Wicklow, south of uh, Dublin, and it had on a lovely sunny day uh, a, a little sign in a window for... Um, uh, for uh, a fortune teller, uh, and it said, Madam Lisa, your past, your present, and your future foretold. And it seems to me, think about it, foretelling your past was one of the things, in a kind of a way, this, this issue reminded me of uh, today. And I think um, uh, Jens, who's here um, in, the, in the audience with us, I think drew up a very interesting second channel about the sovereign banking crisis, which wasn't the one that we know in Ireland of a stressed sovereign loaded with the, loaded with the socialized debt of bank recapitalization, but a different thing. The kind of Italian example, I suppose, is the, the, the biggest one on his bar chart, if I could see it at the distance I was, of a very large uh, debt to GDP ratio that traditionally and without problem has been financed and refinanced by Italian banks. But when the sovereign starts to hit a crisis, it feeds back 
naturally into the banks. So almost the reverse of the Irish case, the more the sovereign is stressed, ipso facto, the more the banks are stressed. So whether you're coming at it through the Irish route in or the Italian route sovereign out, the banking union thing clearly is, is, uh, is, is uh, very central. I thought Patrick Honan made a number of important, drew a number of important distinctions that an Irish audience, particularly in political debate, needs to, to, to keep a clear focus on. The clear distinction between that part of our indebtedness, which is banking related, and that part of the public indebtedness, which is the underlying budgetary case. And as we see, uh, the, the budgetary part is the most significant part, even though the banking part is by no means negligible. I think the second thing which is interesting and frequently absent from appreciation in Ireland is the extent to which public official funding has managed to slow down the Irish adjustment process and curiously difficult as it is to render it less brutal than it might be in the absence of such funding. I suppose that's hard enough to appreciate but it is, I think, conceptually and empirically a very strong observation uh, not to be set to one side. The question was this summit a seismic event. The Taoiseach said yes this morning, I heard him on the radio. Carl Whelan expressed his doubts. Patrick Honahan called it an important turning point. My own summary is I think it was a seismic event because it was groundbreaking and ground changing. And for that reason, I think it's seismic. But I would still hold my judgment on how powerful will it be on the economic Richter scale because we need to see how far and how fast will its implications go. Uh, Donald Donovan raised a very interesting question. I go back to my tail or dog analogy about Ireland. Can we Irish contribute more? I think the answer is yes, and I think this institution uh, is a leading example of it. We have things to say. We have capacity, political, uh, intellectual, um, experiential, which is powerfully real. And we should not trade it off only and always to wonder what is the implication of someone else's thought process for its impact on our small state. That is the great part of pooling sovereignty. You lose bits, but you gain bits. Please do not squander our say in the bigger space by simply the reductionism of wondering always its impact on us without bringing to it our own uh, legitimate and valid view, not overstated, but not to be underestimated if it is coherent and broadly disinterested uh, in terms of the broader project. I think in terms of locating the future and where all this brings us, uh, today shows that we need to deepen these kinds of reflections. I was fascinated by an exchange between Peter Matthews and John Bruton this morning about their respective guesstimates of what the size of the Spanish banking bailout could be. And it reminded me of what is my favorite quote in this regard, which I share with you from Niels Bohr, the Danish physicist who won the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1923. Bohr said, uh, spelled B-O-H-R, not B-O-R-E. He said, prediction, he said, is very difficult, especially when it's about the future. Joseph Janning of the EPC, and I'm bringing my remarks, uh, Chairman, to, a, to a, a close, underlined the way in which, for many years, there were some key questions we chose to avoid. And this crisis has crystallized those questions in a way that makes them unavoidable. And striking the new balances, for example, the consequences of adjusting Europe to the new global realities of the 21st century, touched on by many speakers, but not wholly developed at length today, striking the balances in interest between creditors and debtors, understanding true federalism, because true federalism is some part which needs strengthening of the center, but counterparts which need logically strengthening of the periphery. And in other words, not some large Euro homogenization as federalism, but something with subtleties and shades of gray. The backdoor logic I, I rather liked. I think we've had Europe by small steps of integration. If something bigger is coming, if a moment of distillation, of crystallization, that gives a big choice between more integration 
or disintegration, if that is the moment whose moment has come to slightly recycle a phrase of Patrick Honahan today, then I think it's a moment that we should confront through the back door, welcome it in through the front door, excuse me, and close that back door. Recognize it as a generational moment, a big question, not a small one, worthy of intellectual rigor and honesty in our political discourse, precisely because so much is at stake. And if we go after it honestly, there's no necessary reason with the collective experience we have that if what is available is good, it cannot be argued for. So today, even as we've explored their margins, tomorrow's Europe, how wide, how deep, how democratic, how fundamental the change, I think it all calls for honesty and debate, of which today has been a good example. I think we are approaching a, a rather bigger rather than a smaller moment, one that can have a generational sense about the choice and a multi-generational consequence in terms of the answers. And we should have the self-confidence, no arrogance, but based on our experience, based on our needs, and based on our capacity to step into this debate, willing to lead and not only to follow, and to understand that where you bring that capacity with an honesty and a vigor, it's not your size that counts, it's your imagination.